course it's weird to start with you know any new job during the pandemic but like i'm just happy i've been one of the great things about doing a podcast over the years is I get a chance to meet people and become friends with them and play bass with them and just get to know them and spend time with them in person. That has totally been true with today's guest. I'm Jason Heath. This is Controversy Conversations, and we're talking today with Nina DeCesar, who recently joined the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, moved cross country during the pandemic. So we talk about that. Prior to that, she was in the Oregon Symphony. And since my last conversation, with her, I believe late 2016 or something like that. I subbed with her in the Oregon Symphony for a couple weeks, gotten to get to know her, spend time with her out here in San Francisco. Just such an awesome person. What a player. What a just amazing figure in the bass world. So we dig into all kinds of topics, what she's been up to, plans for the future, all sorts of good stuff. Got her website linked up, her social media. Definitely follow her on Instagram if you're not. And just she's a powerhouse in the bass world. What an awesome person. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them in a bit. Let's dig into this conversation, though, with Nina DeCesar. I was thinking about the last time we did one of these, and that was like, it felt it's like eons ago. I don't think we'd even met, and I was looking at it, it was like episode like 250 something or something like that. So I just put out episode 800. <laughs> <laughs> today oh my god wow that's crazy yeah i was about to ask like what number you're at <laughs> yeah it's stupid i would never i would never recommend anybody do podcasting the way i do it if anyone's gonna start because I've, I've been do this crazy thing where i put out two a week and i've been doing that but it's just like it's just I, I don't know in more normal times like i go to a lot of places and i talk to a whole bunch of people and it feels weird to sit on conversations like if i don't do that what happens is i talk to somebody and then the episode comes out like 10 months later and and there, you, it's sort of, it feels sort of lame to do that because you're like talking about stuff that's happening and then it's, it's like ancient history. So, um, but, but like just, you know, it's, it's, it, sometimes it feels like a lot. It feels like a lot these days for some reason, the zoom, I don't know. Anyway, the things I've been thinking about the last year, but I, I just saw you, you know, we were at the, over the Pittsburgh, I was watching your master class like two weeks ago or something like that for Micah's event in Pittsburgh. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Yeah. I hope I get to go there and person sometime I remember going to that symposium when I was like 15 and I remember I saw Sam Suggs play for the very first time and I was just like blown away I think he maybe won that competition or something I don't know and like Sam's mom and my mom like talked for like two hours wow. <laughs> and, like, my mom still remembers Sam from that and like Sam like has no recollection of her mom's talking at all <laughs> Just really funny. <laughs> well, that, that's part of the great part of that. It's not like I, I sort of group things in the East Coast together. In reality, Baltimore is not like next door to Pittsburgh, certainly. But like one of the cool things about that, though, is like, you know, you look at that Pittsburgh Bay Symposium and they're pulling people from Ohio. They're pulling people from Pennsylvania. Max Dimoff comes in from Cleveland. You know, they're just so many people. That's something you don't. And you probably felt that for sure in Oregon. But like, you know, these are big cities out here. San Francisco more so than Portland, but still I feel isolated out here on the West Coast. And it, it's it's weird to say that in California with almost 40 million people, but still it's like, it's like, yeah, but but there's just us. And then it's like six hours to LA and it's like a bajillion hours to Portland. So you really are like, you just feel kind of removed. And that's one of the cool things about, I felt that way in Chicago, you know, you're like four hours drive to Indianapolis, eight hours to Minneapolis, uh, get a bunch of other things, you know, Detroit, five hours away so that's that's another nice thing about being in the eastern half of the country i think oh yeah definitely yeah we felt super isolated in portland and it, like once again it's like the flights are so expensive and they're all so long and like mm -hmm. can't really drive anywhere but seattle mm -hmm. but there's also mountains on the west coast and, yes i mean there's the appalachian appalachian sorry <laughs> here but <laughs> well, and you seem to take advantage. I mean, it seemed like you really like, to, I remember you talking like biking to the hall, if I remember right. And, you know, my, bro my brother, I'm, bu I'm I'm happy for you. It sounds like a good move, but I'm also bummed that, that you're not out here anymore because my brother moved to Portland like last year, two years ago. Yeah, they live in Selwood, uh, right, right right near Chuck Israel's, hilariously. Um, but um, so I, uh, I've been, I, I thought I'd be going to Portland a lot. I haven't gone because 
because I haven't gone anywhere. But um, I'm I'm looking for. I, I like Portland. It's fun. I think I'll try to not visit in. I I subbed with the orchestra. It was like February, and I remember it was like 30, 32 degrees and raining or snowing the whole time. So it was a, I was it was a little. I know that's not the way it always is but um <laughs> it kind of feels like it actually <laughs> the summer's really nice between like you know june and september is gorgeous but yeah yeah the rain the rain doesn't stop there that's for sure D- does that drive you does that does that get you down like having like it be just cloudy all the time it bugs me so I, i'm just okay yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, especially last year when like we knew we were moving to Baltimore, but we were still in Portland and then we were like quarantined in Portland. I was just like, the, I was so done with the rain and we had this puppy and like it was always raining and the puppy always had to pee and it was like standing in the rain with the, this giant puppy. <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny because yeah. people, people think that of sometimes people kind of plop San Francisco into the Pacific Northwest, which it is not at all. It's like it's 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 kind of the beginning of I don't know what you'd call it, but it's certainly it's cloudier here than L.A., but that's not saying much. It's never cloudy in L.A. It's generally sunny here. But, you know, in the winter, we have some stretches, nothing like what B- Portland or Seattle get. But, you know, we get these stretches and I get I get bummed out. Um, but I noticed like when I moved here, I think it's five or six years ago at this point just my overall mood was just sort of better because it's generally a sunny day out here and and that's that that had a big impact um the on then chicago which i i don't know chicago and baltimore might be similar but but it's uh yeah the that's one of the things i really like about being out here and you guys recently moved right and you adopted a dog exactly <laughs> yeah let me where, we're living like parallel lives I, right I, now <laughs> i know here i gotta get, get my dog william come here say hi to nina come here do you still have the what's your other okay you have two dogs now then yeah so this is misty she's seven i adopted her in houston right before i moved to portland and then uh now we have merlin who's 80 pounds that's the dog. Okay, so here now you get a view of William. This is William. So, oh, so he is a. Hi, he, you, there's definitely a lot of Chihuahua in here. <laughs> I think that's. But he's actually mostly poodle more than anything. He's poodle then Chihuahua and then he's like, um, I don't Pomeranian and cocker spaniel and then I think the rest of his DNA thing said super mutt. So he's just like a bunch of everything. So. <laughs> Misty's a super mutt, but she's 12% Rottweiler, supposedly. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Which, like, she's so not a Rottweiler, but... <laughs> wow. Now, yeah. now, have you started... Um, have you have you been doing... Con- What's Baltimore Symphony been doing? Have you... Uh, I know it was, like, funny timing to get the job. <laughs> like, have, I'm assuming it's you've done something at this point, musically. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've been incredibly fortunate... Um, you know, it's it's kind of it's interesting because they were locked out right right after the audition happened, mm-hmm. and then they finished the lockout, and they were actually negotiating all the way up until last August. Um, so luckily, um, they were able to sign like a an awesome five year contract, and we've been working basically every week since the beginning of September. Wow, strings mostly. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, we're recording these like concert documentary so it'll be like a piece and then like some interviews and some like explanation about the pieces and they come out every week um so yeah i mean it's been lighter in the past couple months because we started adding winds and brass so um they've rotated the strings a little bit but yeah it's been great we got to play some really great rep like um bartok music for strings percussion to last um, last week we did the Rouse concerto for strings, which is like mm. kind of an unknown, but like mm-hmm. really awesome and super fun piece. So oh, cool. yeah, I'm incredibly, incredibly fortunate to have like landed here. Of course it's weird to start with, you know, any new job during the pandemic, but like, I'm just happy I've been playing, you know? So yeah, that's gotta be great. I, I, I just put my base case on my base, not because I have any reason. I, I'm filming a video about base cases and I realized the last time I put my base in its case was like March 10th last year. And I, it was, you know, I think everybody remembers their last time playing before the pandemic, but I was playing with this this base uh, quartet, an Andres Martin ba- base quartet. It was for the, we flew Xavier Foley out here for the base bash. And 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 it was it was that weird moment where uh, we weren't sure, like, like, 
I think the schools were still in session, but they said the students couldn't come to the event, but the adults could come. So it was this poor Xavier flew from Philadelphia to San Francisco and like played for my video camera and like eight people. But then like that, we played that. And then like two days later, shelter in place happened. And so um, it's, I, I sometimes I open up my closet and I look at my tails and I think, I remember you. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it must have, um, it's cool that you've been, that you've been active like that. Where, where is, I know where Peabody is in Baltimore. I don't know Baltimore that well. Like where is the hall in relation to like Peabody or the Inner Harbor or whatever? Um, it's pretty close to Peabody. Okay. I think it's like five to 10 minute walk from Peabody. Okay. Um, yeah, honestly, I haven't walked around that much because obviously like yeah. pandemic, we mostly stay home unless we're walking our dogs. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's kind of like it's probably like a mile and a half from the harbor. OK, I don't know. OK, it's going to be like true Baltimoreans listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually from the suburbs. I should clarify. Like, I'm from here, but like from outside of the city. Here's Mark Gelfo from Audacity on varied repetition. When you repeat something, for example, a scale or an etude, you don't want to do it the same every time. If you vary it a little bit, it gives you more resilience in the skill. And not only that, it resets this kind of initial learning curve each time you do it very differently so that you can make more gains, get those initial gains of learning faster over and over and over again by repeating your material in different ways. That's what varied repetition is. Fast, slow, um, legato, staccato, angry, joyful. And one way that we allow you to do that in modacity is by taking notes and you can just make a note that says play it joyfully play it angrily and archive and unarchive and cycle through your favorite variations i do that a lot with uh, different keys for example on licks that i'm learning you can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash cbc and thank you modacity for sponsoring the podcast this episode is brought to you by Dorico. And one of the things that struck me about Dorico when I first opened it up was this innovative user interface design. There are five different modes. There is setup, write, engrave, play, and print mode. And here is senior product manager Daniel Spreadbury and why they set it up like this. As they are presented to you on the screen, they're kind of there in a strip at the top left-hand corner of the screen. And they're very prominent. You can whack them with your mouse or if you're using a surface, you can tap them with your finger. And that basically then changes the whole UI of the program. It is such an innovative design. It makes working for me so much cleaner in music notation software. I have become such a fan. I use this piece of software every single day. Check them out at dorico.com that'll take you to their page on steinberg's website and there's a free version dorico se that'll let you do practically everything the program does with up to two parts so that's perfect if you're working with a student or making exercises or that kind of thing thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast dorico there's a super cool bass player named Chris Fun that I had on recently, uh, somewhere within the last year, and he's got an uh, his his like kind of he's uh, got all sorts of it's like Baltimore and all its like glory and and you know not so positive aspects. He's like, but he's his whole motto is like Baltimore, greatest city in America, and he's got it's like that's his imagery and everything. Super interesting guy. Um, you know, one of my former students was playing a whole bunch of one years in Baltimore. Drew Band half um who, who i don't know if i don't know if you've met him i think he's still in baltimore right now I, uh, he's he's probably we not... went to rice together oh get, get out of town maybe we talked about yeah. this at some point nina i i, I, I probably i know we have like <laughs> so many people in common but okay that's cool he's one of, he yeah drew also has a big puppy and our puppies have played together before oh. he's like one of the few dogs that's like almost as big as marlon okay yeah, his dog is archer yeah wow okay yeah i you know what i know we've talked about this before actually i'm remembering hey did did you overlap with Ian Hallis at all too? Okay. Okay. Ian and I keep in touch. It's, it's, it's really fun to, um, and this will almost certainly happen with you and some of the students you've had, but like, it's really fun to like to have that relationship over decades and people that like, I remember both Ian and Drew when they were like in sixth grade or fifth grade, especially Ian, I think he started with me in fifth grade and I have some old photos of like the whitewater winter bass festival we had. And he's like walking around and like oversized t-shirt and it's just so cool it's so cool to see um where people go yeah definitely wow. 
Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's, 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 that's great. Well, I, I, congratulations. And that's really, um, do you have, uh, do they have, have things been announced for next year, next season? Like, are they, is the plan to start up in the fall in person or have, has that been announced publicly at all? Yeah, they've announced a season. Okay. Um, and it, I think, well, it's like definitely on the smaller size for ensembles for the first couple of months. Mm-hmm. I think the plan is to go back to normal. Okay, cool. Um, you know, with like, vaccines and everything so i mean we'll keep our fingers crossed but you know barring like another pandemic like hopefully we're getting close to somewhat normal you were in uh you were in oregon for like five years six years something like that five years okay. yeah yeah it was a long time technically four and three quarters years okay okay well, did you le- did you get there <laughs> were you like mid masters or had you already graduated Wait, remind me yeah so i um I did my undergrad at Rice um, with Paul, and then I was um, I started my master's also with Paul, and I actually won my job like a couple months into that first year. Um, but I finished the year because I really wanted to play like a another recital, like a master's recital. That's cool. I had this idea that like I was never going to play solo music again now that I was like going to play an orchestra, which I think is such like a overdramatic twenty two year old view of <laughs> um, the world, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly have kept kept busy playing things outside of the orchestra. It's been really fun to follow along with everything. You put out this great video with I think it's uh, was it Maggie Cox that you were playing with uh, the 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 Dave Anderson, right? The, yeah. Both sounding sounding awesome on that. So that I I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. She came to stay with me this week. Um, we actually recorded you know the Edgar Meyer Cannon. Mm-hmm. Um. So we yeah our whole. That we've been working towards recording that together for like a potential ISB recital. We might just post it on YouTube or something. We're not sure where we're going to put it yet, but yeah. So she's been here and we've just been like playing duets all week and it's been awesome. She is an incredible player. Yeah. yeah. She's a great player and, and so such a cool person. I, she and I t- talked at the last ISB convention for, for the podcast. And that was really fun to like, uh, uh, get, that was the first time I'd met her, but, but yeah, very cool. That's great that she's, that she's been out there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And she bought uh, Galen McCormick's old bass. So that's kind of like a fun. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, where I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember. Wait. Okay. So, I mean, I feel like I've seen you doing a whole bunch of things during the pandemic. Have you been doing other symposium like events, like master classes and that thing, kind of thing? And um, like, I am uh, doing like a, a free master class this weekend. Yeah. I think there was a lot going on last summer. It feels like a long time ago, actually, but. Yeah, so I'm like teaching here and there, lots of recording one minute videos yeah. <laughs> for Instagram. Have had had you moved? Uh, had you already? Were you still in Oregon when the pandemic hit, or had? You, okay, yikes. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I was supposed to move. Oh, gosh, that's right. We were, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a whole situation at the beginning of last March. We were like trying to do a DIY kitchen renovation. Um, like when the lockdown was announced okay. basically. And it was super bizarre because my last concert with the Oregon Symphony actually turned out to be like a kid's concert in Salem, Oregon. And like our associate conductor was actually sick. So like Carlos Calmar was conducting the kid's concert in Salem. It was bizarre. And it was like a morning concert. And like, we were supposed to play um, the Barrio Symphonia with um, this incredible acapella group, Room Full of Teeth that week. And we did the Wednesday rehearsal. And then like that Thursday, like they sat us all down and they were like, all right, well, (laughs) you know, we're canceled for the next two weeks. And I was like, okay (laughs) you know and then it was a month and then it was like okay when are we moving to baltimore like are we still selling our house like it was this yeah it was kind of a disaster but we moved in late june is when we finally ended up making the move okay wow yeah what a chaotic time to be yeah we moved uh our move was much less dramatic than your move uh we moved from right over there uh like like i can see my old place almost uh, to here we moved like two buildings over we bought a place in this building and so um i i but but that that was i think we closed the week before shelter in place or something like that so i've just been s- spending a lot more time doing home projects like everybody <laughs> than i was i was yeah. expecting uh what 
what does, uh, what, do, how, I, it's so hard to compare like what a job is like, probably like, cause this is a, a, not a normal year. Right. But like, what's the, what's the gig in Baltimore like compared to the gig in Oregon? I, you know, like just in terms of the season length, like the, like the, what are, what are your impressions so far? And obviously you know what the Baltimore symphony was like pre pandemic too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Baltimore is a 52 week orchestra. Um, Oregon recently added two weeks to their season actually, which is, um, pretty special for orchestras to be adding weeks at this point. So they are at 40 weeks now. Um, let's see, I think probably same number of musicians in each group. Um, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing for me is the, the hall in Portland is gorgeous, but also like has its challenges. You, you came and subbed, so you might've remembered. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a, and that's such a tough thing to re to replace, you know, that's like such a massive investment. So like, if you're kind of stuck with a hall, that's not the what cause it's not like the worst hall on earth. Well, maybe people would argue, but I don't, I, it's just like not the greatest. It's not a great acoustic, but that's tough. That's that's a right. that's a tough thing. That's it's kind of, it's a bummer if that's what your musical existence is, right? Right. And the the hardest thing is um, the bass sound doesn't carry it all in that ball. So we were just constantly digging in as much as we could. Um, and there's like not very much room on stage, so like we couldn't fit the risers half the time. So like that would help amplify us a bit. But then like for Heldenleben, they wouldn't fit. So yeah, but they're actually um, installing this like Myers sound system, like constellation system, which I think they use in San Francisco, like the sound box. Have you heard of yeah, this? I have heard, I have heard of that. Um, but yeah, maybe ex yes. I, in fact, I weren't they talking about doing that when I was subbing a couple years ago, I remember hearing some, some description of that just to improve the acoustic, right. Is what that is supposed yeah, to do. it's been a conversation for a long time. So um, they were able to get that done because the the schnitz has been shut down for basically mm. over a year. So um, yeah, they were able to do that. And it's basically an amplification system. I think it replaced the shell mm -hmm. um, and that's supposed to really help with the acoustic. But yeah, I mean, in comparison to Baltimore, Baltimore has this amazing Meyerhoff Hall and then the Strathmore also. Um, so in terms of just like showing up and playing, it's easier to play in the hall here in comparison to Oregon. <laughs> Um, yeah, that makes a big deal. That's something that somebody might not realize how much a, a big deal that is until that's like their existence, and especially someone who's like more of a freelancer, maybe who plays in a whole bunch of different places when like, that's just your life going in there. You know, Davies is a, is a decent acoustic here uh, in San Francisco. The problem is da Davies is just old. It's showing its age. It's, f it was built in 1980. So what is that? 41 years. And it, you can feel those 41 years. So everything's just like a little grungy, you know, I, I, but I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone's predicting a hall in the, in, you know, a, a new hall uh, anytime soon, but may, maybe a renovation. I mean, I'm sure people would, would hope, but the, the acoustic, I think they had to dial it in a little bit over the first few years, but it's, it's incredible what, what, a what an impact that can have just in like the morale of the group or the, you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Peter Ruffay, who's one of the bassists in the LA Phil, who was there. Well, Disney hall is not that old really, but he was there before and after and you know it's like you get a transition like you get something like that 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 like marks the transition for a group a lot of the time and it's interesting too like how different your bass can feel in like a, a really nice hall versus one that like maybe isn't as forgiving you know like you can like feel the vibrations better in like a nice hall versus mm -hmm. you know you kind of feel like your sound is like cardboard like the bridge is cardboard or something yeah yeah <laughs> but i know after several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course, Beginner's Classical Bass, is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass, starting from taking your bass out of the case, which is very fun, <laughs> to film and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass, and I have a great blooper reel about that, and leading to different bow strokes, such as staccato and portato. The topics also include posture, simple scales and arpeggios, left-hand technique, bowing technique, simple pieces, which are fun to play, practice tips, and much more. You can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contrabass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic 
with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. You seem really happy. It seems it sounds like a great setup, except of course global pandemics. But hopefully, we're on the tail end of that. It's it's been it's been cra- It's been interesting. Uh, I, I'm I'm trying to stay off social media as much as I can, just so I don't doom scroll myself, you know, through the pandemic. But it's been interesting following along with like how other countries are handling things, and some of them not as well. But like one that is, if, I, if I'm in kind of a dark mood, I just look at like Australia, like uh, Phoebe Russell, you know, in Queensland. They're like playing concerts like normal but it's it's that weird situation where the vaccine rollouts haven't happened so it could turn into a total disaster so it's kind of like the walking dead or something where like you know it's like everything's fine but it, but like one case breaks out and and then they shut down all of western australia and um but that has given me you know uh, and, and finally signs of life are coming back here and there's music on the streets you know there's no symphonic music to speak of except the san francisco symphony is doing similar to what you, what you got you all are doing but yeah it's it's um it's 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 been interesting i was talking to nikki schwartz uh this earlier today who's in the concertgebouw orchestra and they're they're kind of in a similar situation they had let crowds in up to 250 people and then the things started to get worse again and so they've just been playing to an empty hall um but uh talking about nice halls made me think about that too because have you ever gotten a chance to play at the concertgebouw oh no i wish i, I hopefully i i, 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 I only <laughs> I only did once in my life. It was like 25 years ago. I was doing the Schleswig Holstein Music Festival. And it was one of those things where we were doing the same program on tour in Europe. And that was such an incredible acoustic to, it was a weird acoustic to play in. Personally, I, I thought, because it was one of those weird acoustics where you could like hear certain things on stage, like incredibly well. Like you'd hear like second clarinet, like strangely well, at least from the bass section. Um, but that, you know, when they renovated a symphony center in Chicago and they finally Finally got it to where it is now. The ba- there was a big improvement in the basses, if I remember correctly. The bass section seemed much happier, and that's that's the sort of thing, especially as a bass player. If you can just get in a place that just welcomes your sound, that's a it's a beautiful thing. Definitely, yeah. And I actually remember playing at the Meyerhoff, the the Baltimore Hall. Um, like Rice University went on tour when I was still an undergrad, um, so I had played here once before, but it was a long time ago. And I remember being blown away by the hall back then too. Wow, that's cool that Rice went on tour. I don't know how many sc- schools do that. Uh, did you go to a few places, or just just to Baltimore and back, or that tour? interestingly they put us up in dc and then bust us to baltimore to play okay. <laughs> bust us back to dc <laughs> and then um we also played at carnegie okay so okay yeah i think they've done it maybe once or twice since then too um they always go to carnegie i think maybe they went to bard last time also bard college oh wow that's cool yeah that's yeah. something at north I, would, I was i went to northwestern northwestern did some uh, but we went somewhere on a, like i went to like the university of illinois or something like that i don't consider that a tour this is like down into the cornfield well, who all was in your rice cohort? So you overlapped with Drew, uh, you and you and Ian too. Uh, so who, yes. who else? I just think I, I love rice in particular. A couple other schools you can sort of like just see the success pouring out of there and where people end up. So like who who else that uh, that has gone on to you know land positions in the base world was in your group. Well, let's see. I have a weekly Zoom call that we started at the beginning of the pandemic with um, Nick Cathcart, who's in Brooklyn, and Kevin Brown, who's principal in Detroit, and Brandon Mason, who's also in Detroit now, and Paul Cannon, who's the bass player for Ensemble Modern, mm-hmm. um, and Jessica Grady, who's also in Detroit. So it's been fun. I don't know. We've gone through so much together, like over the past year and it's been really interesting to like be able to like reconnect because you know the five of us hadn't been in the same room and like you know, seven or eight years. And like, suddenly, you know, it feels like we're like active in each other's lives again. So wow. that's been pretty cool. Oh, that's a great, that's a great uh, way. That's a great, it's, it's gotta be nice. Also just, just it, what a weird time to be a performing musician. It's gotta be nice to at least know that everybody's kind of in the same boat. And um, yeah, did, did, when you knew this pandemic was gonna last a long time, I mean, like, like have things go, this is an 
in, this question might not work at all, Nina, but let me see if I could try to frame it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll tell you my perspective, and I'd just love to hear you. I, 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 things are have survived better than I thought they would. If you had talked to Jason in like June 2020, I'm like, this city's going down, 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 this cut, you know, everything. And like, you know, the, and then July, August, and then of course, out here, the, the wildfires started. And we had this one day in San Francisco where the sun never rose. It was like living on Mars. Like I went outside and it was this like dark red with my dog. And I was like, you know, um, and, and uh, I was just, I was seeing everything boarding up in San Francisco, but like actually walking around my neighborhood now, more has survived than I thought. Some new things have actually popped up, which is crazy. Like some indie, like, like funky, uh, to, uh, like uh, art artisanal sort of shops. So like, I'm feeling much more positive just about, and then like seasons ring announced, like, uh, and I don't even know if I have a question in here, but like how have, have, what were your expectations? Like maybe a year, like, how were you doing? I, I feel like I've like been on the verge of losing my mind a few times these last 14 months. Um, but I'm feeling much yeah. better now. And I'm, 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 I'm I, I, how's it been for you? Maybe that's what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that there was definitely a question in there and I heard it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, so I started in Oregon and we were immediately furloughed and my husband had just, Done. He had started a coding boot camp in January, so he was also unemployed. So we kind of went from like, yay, we're moving, and like we're both probably starting new jobs, and like things are looking really great, to like, oh god, suddenly both of us are unemployed, and like, are we moving? Um, yeah, being furloughed isn't fun. Um, so yeah, that was the point where like the first week I just like was watching TV and like drinking wine. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I like, I don't know if you um, heard about this Bach project that I did, but I, um, you know, Elisa Weilerstein, she did yeah. the 36 days of Bach. Mm -hmm. And actually I didn't know that she was doing it, but my friend, James Shields, he's the principal clarinet in Oregon. And so he was doing it on bass clarinet and like a week in, you know, we were both like, you know, having cocktails on a zoom call. And I was just like, I'm losing my mind. I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, I'm doing this project. Like, and I was like, great. Awesome. You know, a little bit tipsy, like I could do that. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter that I hadn't learned the fourth, fifth or sixth week. So yeah, that was the first like little chunk of the pandemic, but there was definitely times like in, I think like June when we were dealing with the stress of moving where like I applied to community college, like I applied to work on a farm. I was just like feeling so not sure that we were going back to work and like that anything was like musical was going to happen again. Um, and it's like, it's crazy. I think everyone was like kind of considering like second career paths and some people have actually like taken the steps towards them. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's been totally nuts. And then like, I feel like the second, I, maybe it was the third wave, I don't know, but we really felt it here, like right after the election when like the cases started going back up and like mm -hmm. my mom was sick and like, we couldn't leave the house and it was like super dark, um, in the winter. So I don't know, you know, it's great. Like it's, it's spring and I'm fully vaccinated. And so is my husband. And so is the rest of my family. And it's like, finally feeling like things might be okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's how it's feeling. That's how it's feeling here too. Like that Courtney got vaccinated. I don't know, back in January or something, cause she's in healthcare, but I'm fi I finally, um, um, you know, with my, my, my number came up and, and yeah, things have, have eased greatly and places are open. I'm seeing people inside again. And so it's, uh, it's good. I, I remember you doing that Bach project. You're such a, an um, incredible player. It's, it's really fun to watch, you know, anything you put out and have put out. So, but I, I remember that I remember you going through my like playing related pandemic project. I, I, I went through all of Dennis Whitaker's incredibly useful exercises and and filled them all with a GoPro on my head, um, which and by the week 16, I was ready to not wear a GoPro on my head and film myself practicing anymore. But I've, I've had a couple of these 16 week projects just being locked at home. Uh, you know, um, well, I've, been, I've done a YouTube video every week for the last 60 weeks or something like that, um, which I don't think I can do once I start getting on the road road again, but that's at least been something, something to try to do. And it's, it's crazy, you know, like someone where you're at or someone, you know, in a full-time major professional orchestra, it's, it's like, it's, the, it's, it's especially tragic, something like this stinking pandemic, because the, the focus that someone in your shoes has had to have to get there, it's like making the Olympic team, right? You know, probably harder. And so in many ways, and, and so, yeah, of course, my, and I, I think you are, have, you're 
interests maybe are even a bit wider than some people. So you probably would be better suited, not that you need to find a second career to do that. But, you know, there's such focus and you get there and you uh, the Mets, like a great example, like, my goodness, those poor people in the orchestra, the, the, what you've had to do, of course, you're not out like like me, like with my like nine careers and stuff like that. I, I'm like much more pandemic proof, apparently. I wasn't trying to be, but I just am because I don't rely, you know, I just playing is like one of many things. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I was talking to Rob Knopper, who's a percussionist in the Met, um, who has run this, uh, this program called Audition Hacker for like, I don't know, six, seven years. Rob, Rob's awesome. But Rob has, it's it's like a second full-time job for him. This audition hacker has been wildly successful. So he's been, he's been, uh, you know, luckily he's, he's sort of set himself up for this pandemic unwittingly. But he and I were talking about like, you know, things that professional musicians have, have done during this time. And it's been really interesting to actually see people with full-time jobs that probably wouldn't have thought about launching something else, seeing like what they've launched and how it's gone. And I'll be curious to see and rob mentioned this too like how many people keep these sort of side things that they've been doing during the pandemic or just like drop it like a hot potato and just get right back to playing i don't know i wonder what'll happen yeah i mean it's crazy because whenever i look at the periods of my life where i was actually playing like a lot of solo music it was always like off season mm -hmm. <laughs> basically um and i do wonder you know like we have a much bigger studio that's easier to practice in here. You know, I'm not like sharing it with my husband's office space. So like, it's possible that I will continue like when the season starts back up, but I mean, usually we're so busy. Mm -hmm. So it's been nice to kind of have the extra time to focus on other things. I'll bet. But it's got to be nice to get back. What was it like when you finally played a con? Because I still haven't played a concert since this pandemic started. I have, I, cause like, I, I do lots of things, but as a bass player, like, I'm, I'm a freelancer around here, and I'm going to be like the last person to do anything because you're just going to like go without, you know, until a certain point. So, like, um, but what was it? Was it exciting? Was it a letdown? I'm sure it's weird because you're probably spaced apart and, and all sorts of things like that. But, like, what was it like when you finally got to play with humans again? Um, it was pretty awesome, but also like I was like the new person <laughs> and we were spaced apart and like I didn't know where the bathroom was. It was just really, yeah. That first week I was like, what's going on? <laughs> um, and it's hard, you know, learning how to play with a mask and like, you know, there's air, you can only walk in a certain direction down each hallway and it's just, you know, it's very bizarre. Um, and we haven't actually played for a live audience here um, in Baltimore, but I played a gig a couple of weeks ago with the Knights um, mm -hmm. and there was like, like 20 patrons or something. And that felt really good. I mean, it was like quieter applause than like, you know, a full concert hall, but like, you know, actually getting to like play for people was, was a nice Nice feeling. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm I'm sure. I, I haven't been playing, but I've been seeing music. Like one of the nice things of California, even here in San Francisco, is it's decent enough all year round that you can be outside. So like we had that si similar to what you're describing. Like things were opening up in the fall, and then that wave came and everything shut down. And then that was like even more depressing because you knew what life could be like with some music again. And and then, but in the last since I don't know February maybe, it, uh, there's a lot of music happening in North Beach here and and um, it's San Francisco it's a big town but it's also like a small town in a lot of ways so I've run into so many people I know playing and a couple of musicians bass player friends of mine they're like this is more work than I've had in years because like all, all the all the club the, the the bars and clubs and stuff in North Beach or many of them ha are, are having bands now and so you're not seeing like symphonic music but I'm hearing a lot of like funk bands and uh, rock bands and jazz and and people just seem so happy to hear music it's like um actually uh when you and zach and my wife and i we went to this little place on the waterfront when you were visiting san francisco and yeah yeah and like two doors down from that place is this great old place called pier 23 cafe everybody knows about it who's into music in san francisco they would have like ragtime on mondays and there's always music and and so we go over there to see music sometimes and the first live music i saw i heard um it's after the shutdown was this funk band in like June or something. And it was like so nice to hear music. So if that's any indication, hopefully like I, I'm going to be at every concert I can uh, as soon as they, they pick back up. Like I, I just think about how much I was taking for granted. Like, you know, I, I was subbing in the symphony here, like 
two weeks before the lockdown. And I never take that for granted, but you know, it's another day and you got the base, blah, 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 go go get some lunch. And like, I just can't. um, So even if it's weird and like, it's like the opposite of what music is supposed to be. Like we're all together having this experience, you know, playing next to someone on stage, you know, Um, but it's still gotta be nice, but weird. It's gotta be like, is it weird to like try? And then especially being the new person, you haven't like, it's a new ensemble to you. Like it's just gotta be strange trying to, trying to like what, yeah. What a weird role to navigate. Yeah. And it's interesting because like usually there's breaks and you meet people on breaks or you go out for a drink after the concert. And like, you know, we're only doing an hour and a half to two hours at a time with no break, Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously there's no going out for a drink (laughs) after anything right now. So yeah, it's been interesting. Like the job doesn't feel new, but like I still, feel very new to like the community of the bso Mm -hmm. Um, but like it's definitely going to change um like everyone is super friendly and welcoming so i'm hoping next year when things are more normal like i'll assimilate a little more cool yeah that's 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 great you know who introduced us i think it was ira gold if i remember right I'm pretty, very possible. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, how did he, c- c- and I remember hanging out with you and Ira, like in Ithaca, maybe something like that. Uh, g- g- I think maybe he had driven to, I don't remember. I, I, my, my memory is getting hazy, but uh, how, uh, how did you two first meet? He was actually my teacher for a hot second in high school. I thought so. <laughs> I thought that was right. Okay. Cause I knew you studied with George Vance, but then you were all, okay. So you were mm-hmm. with Ira too. Okay. Wow. How cool. But yeah. Then I studied with actually Ali Yasmin but mm-hmm. he moved to Montreal to take the principal job. Mm-hmm. So then I studied with Ira and Hal sim- simultaneously actually. So yeah, he, um, but now we're like, we're colleagues and it's crazy. Like when he first told me he was 26, when he was teaching me, my mind was just like blown. Like, I think I was 26 when he told me that. And I was like, what? I remember I read 26 that I re- he was like an old soul already. Cause you know, I, I was playing with him. Actually, I, he was probably more like 22 when I was playing with him. He and I played in the Iris chamber orchestra in Memphis. And I remember that was when he was, he was, on the audition trail and he wasn't on the audition trail for long he took like three auditions did well at two of them and one 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 of them but i remember him playing his excerpts for me backstage and i was like yep that's how it goes <laughs> it's pretty good you know how do you do that stroke how do that's you do actually that? how i feel i just heard maggie maggie cox just played her excerpts for me and i was like wow okay <laughs> you sound incredible <laughs> so i'm excited when auditions start again for to see how it goes for her very exciting. Was it weird taking auditions while you already had a full-time job? This is something that Dave Moore asked me to ask people because like, I, I, I don't talk necessarily. I, I went on this big kick in like 2016, 2017 to talking to like everybody about auditions and, and I, I, I still like talking about auditions, but I, it just doesn't come up as much. But like, that was something that I, I, people who have won a job after, because because like life as a student, as you know, is just so different than life when you're you know you get you're more settled. You got someplace you got to be. Like, was it was it weird to fit that prep in, or like just how how was that for you while you were playing in Oregon? So. Yeah, the the time of that audition was insane because it was right after ISB. Mm. I think you, I saw you at yeah, the last yeah. ISB in Bloomington. Mm-hmm. And so our season ended, I think, like May 20th or something. And the audition was June 17th. So actually, I wasn't working for most of my prep time, but I was driving across the country. And also, I was getting ready to get married at the end of June. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was this like crazy time. It was me and Misty in like my very old dying car and my base, <laughs> like on our way to ISB, on our way to this audition. <laughs> like right before my wedding, I was like planning my wedding, like in the practice room. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, waiting to play my audition. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It is my other experiences auditioning while I did have my job. Um, it definitely didn't go as well as I hoped for many of those auditions. And I do think it's so difficult to balance just physically how difficult the job can be. And then practicing on top of that, you know, if you have a double and you're, you're at work from eight 30 until, you know, four o'clock, you're not going to come home and practice for another three hours. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's definitely it's definitely really challenging. It's, it's just kind of cool that like it, you know the, nobody would take what you just described as like the ideal audition circumstance, right? You know, like like road, road tripping acro- across the country and like planning a wedding <laughs> and doing all that, but it worked out. So yeah. it's like it's like yeah, you want to plan and do the best you can and like work like a professional, but sometimes it's I think Brett Shirtliff, who I, I is he principal of Buffalo, I believe I can't remember exactly, but he he had some sort of crazy. I was talking to him at the last. ISB for the podcast and he had I think he had just had his first kid like the day two days before the audition or something and hadn't slept at all and almost didn't do it and drove and won and so you just you know yeah it doesn't mean that one should like plan on flying in and getting no sleep and taking the audition you know plan intelligently but even if things don't go according to plan you know are, are you a are you a big like I remember talking to Ian Hallis in particular, but other people that were kind of in that cohort at Rice and like the meticulousness of audition planning, like Ian, I, I, he, I, he changed what he did a little bit after, cause he, I think he's auditioned for lyric opera four times at this point, winning every one, you know, he like got into the section now he's principal, but, um, he was like someone who would like plot his metro markings out. Like he's like in February, I want to be at 80 beats per minute. And in, in the third week of February, I want to be at 80 seven you know and, and he would like follow this were are you were you like a um crazy planner like that or is that was that not your style i don't i don't think i've gone quite that far <laughs> um and yeah ian's definitely super organized i think he was like a year above me at rice but he was two years older because he he started at colburn and then transferred mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. um but yeah he's just super organized and, and focused he's always been like that he would get to you know the studio at like 7 a.m every morning to start practicing <laughs> I remember that about Ian, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I have every audition I've treated slightly different, you know, I've been trying to figure out what actually works and it's so hard to tell like what works and like, what is just like what the committee feels like on that day. It's really hard to tell. Um, the thing that really works for me for auditions is recording like a lot. Um, so like starting like two weeks before I'll record every day but then the week before i'll actually just record um depending on how long the list is either the full list or like rounds um throughout the day and like listen back um and like sometimes when you listen like it's listening for like things to fix but it's also interesting because if you do a bunch back to back you start to realize like even if something feels really different in between the takes like it sounds almost exactly the same Mm -hmm. so it actually like develops confidence and like being able to like show up and produce like what you know, what you sound like, even if, you know, you're like micromanaging in your head while you're doing it. Um, I don't know. So yeah, recording has really helped me like foster confidence in terms of like knowing that I can just um, sound the same pretty much all the time. Yeah. That's one of those things I I remember. I don't remember if it was, I don't remember who the heck it was. It was some old ISB journal back when I was in college, like, like somebody famous can't remember was quoted saying like nerves affect how you think about your playing more than your actual playing. And I found that to be the case too. You know, it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, how, how, how can, yeah. How your perception of your playing versus the actual consistency that you're delivering, uh, can be, do you take a lot of notes on, or is it just like mental notes when you're prepping like that with recording? Sometimes it depends where I am in my process, but I'll usually like, if I'm listening to the round and it's like, you know, not the day before, but maybe the week before I'll like put a couple like words down for each one, like things um, I want to fix. Cause it's also hard to tell when you're playing, like what it actually sounds like. Ideally. Yeah. Like when we're practicing, we're like being like criticizing ourselves and, and figuring out how to improve, but it's much easier to like, listen back to like what's happening than to do it in the moment while you're playing. Cause you're supposed to be focusing on what you're doing, <laughs> not on like what you're doing wrong. So right. Right. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Recording is such a good tool. <laughs> yeah. That it's like separating out the analysis from the execution. That's like such a, yeah, that's such a, I've been using this app modacity who's who the, 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 the person who founded it has been become a friend of mine here in San Francisco. It's funny. He, they were actually, running their company on my street like a couple blocks down and but that app it has it has two things in the interface that are front and center it's got just a, a timer just 
ticking away how long you've been using it and then just this record button and it's funny how having that record button in front of my face made me go from someone who almost never recorded themselves but to it's just there's that button i'm gonna press that button i i, I got myself in the habit of like recording myself like in little chunks all the time and even though i'm like certainly not prepping for any auditions or like really prepping for anything right now i just i i i found myself recording myself much more frequently just by like having that out and available and it's like i've had some Something to record myself with ever since I was in college, whether it was a micro cassette recorder or whatever. But just having that like in front of me has made me much more likely. Do, do you record? Um, I'm asking super nerdy questions. Sorry, but do you record it just on your phone, or do you ever break out some good mics, or try to get in a hall, or get the mics away from you, or um, what do you usually do? <laughs> Honestly, I just use my phone. Yeah. Um, we do have like good mics, but I don't have a laptop actually, so. My, my whole issue is like, if I want to use the microphone, then like my husband has to be like taking a break and like helping me plug into the audio interface. <laughs> um, so yeah. And ideally I would be like getting into a hall and all that, but um, I, yeah, I just use my phone. That's great. And it's weird too. Like I remember when I was in college, I was so scared to record myself and listen to it because it always felt like I was going to be like, I don't know. My, my self-esteem was going to be crushed by like the trueness of <laughs> how I sound um but I don't know I feel like that's a hump everyone's got to get over it at some point like you sound how you sound and it's better to at least like you know know yeah <laughs> like be able to listen back and be realistic with yourself than like hide from it oh yeah for sure and and you get so much information off a of phone recording I think I was talking to Blake Hinson uh, about he I mean so many people are into recording but he is like at the time at least I think this was 2018 had become like obsessed with just like video recording on the iPhone himself all the time and his students and he would like play it back and slow-mo you know to show all sorts of things and which i think is is uh pretty cool I, I love that you don't have a laptop that's that's awesome are you just like rock rocking an ipad or something or or just your phone or? yeah okay. i didn't have an ipad until the end of 2019 too yeah and what happened misty when i adopted her and she was like younger she like jumped i was holding tea and she like knocked the tea on my laptop and so yeah i just didn't buy one and it's weird like now that I'm not a student, I don't really need a laptop for most things. So I was just like writing emails on my phone. But yeah, the iPad is definitely an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, do you use it for I, I got the in 2017, I got the iPad Pro, the big one with the pencil. I just I, I got a gig that paid about what it cost. I was just being cheap and I just didn't want to because it's a chunk of change to get that. But I, and it had, I've used it way. It, it has I, I, I basically only use that to read music unless I'm like playing a gig you know, like an orchestra gig. Um, but it's it's been really cool how uh, I feel like it's just made me more organized like as a teacher like I always have all my music with me at all the time are, are you using it for music as well or is it just like your email machine um sometimes I use it like if I want to post something up on IMSLP or like if they emailed us practice parts and I haven't printed it out but um I use yoga blocks when I play, mm -hmm. so I don't have like the page turn thing because mm. it just feels like especially like wearing heels and yoga mm -hmm. blocks and like mm -hmm turning pages with my foot it just sounds like a you know a recipe for disaster so yeah haven't gone that direction well, it, it gives me new respect for uh, p pianists not a, that i didn't have respect for them but like like the the i am so bad at pressing the button for turning the page it's hilarious i have like almost screwed up concert i mean I've, I've never used it for an ensemble concert well i've used it for chamber music but i've never used it for like an orchestra concert but i have all I, i'll like be playing and i'll look and my stinking foot pedals like just slightly too far away and i have to like and i think it is one button I have to press like once every few mitten, mi minutes and I, I can barely do it. But just the organization factor, it's like been so great for teaching because I can like write down fingerings and I can just text them a copy with my fingerings. And I've even been playing around with this new, this relatively new app called Music. And it is, it's a, it's a sheet music reader, kind of like four score, some of these, but it's got a few more features and it's got some, some ways that you can sync up what you're writing with another person's music app. So I'm sort of seeing the future when I see this, like you're right, you can write fingerings that'll appear on someone else's iPad and they are coming out with a, a mode that they have some 
artificial intelligence that that look it's incredible i watched a demo uh on youtube yesterday it will scan any pdf if it's a good pdf you just put it in there hit this button and it will create a midi file out of it so you can like create a play along track i know it's like the future so you can you can like put in the kusevitsky concerto and all of a sudden you'll have a kusevitsky concerto put in kusevitsky concerto piano part and it will uh, so I, I you know those are the sort of things that get me that get me excited <laughs> yeah, that's totally nuts and now they have the, the thing where you can turn a MIDI into like sheet music, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's amazing. That's like, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Just think about all the times I was like trying to like read, you know, like cello music, like a note down for mm -hmm. solo tuning or something. And now just like with a touch of a button, you can transpose anything. It's awesome. I know. I know. It's great. It's crazy. That's uh, wow. Uh, what's uh i'm so bummed that we weren't able to get you and zach out here for the golden gate base camp before you move we'll have to get out, oh, yeah. out here anyway even if it's a long plane ride maybe we can get and you have dogs maybe it'll be hard to get you out here but we, we, we're gonna try <laughs> you would have you... actually my, my family is here so we we can just leave the dogs oh, there you that's go. one of the perks of of living close to family yeah <laughs> okay okay um what what are 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 you working on any new solo stuff these days or like what are you what are you playing uh, outside of the orchestra i know you had the bach project and i've heard you play a bunch of you know lloyd's pieces over the years uh you working on anything exciting right now well um yeah i'm supposed to be like the fifth suite basically um so you, have you heard of string virtuoso i'm sure oh sure yeah yeah yeah, so I, I was supposed to be working with them and, and recording the fifth suite and um, making my own edition oh, um, cool. Bach for Small Hands, basically. Nice. Yes. So, yeah, that's that's the goal. Um, I was hoping to record in April, and here we are, it's May. Um, <laughs> soon to be June, uh, probably. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's the first time I've, like, created my own edition of something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know, like, I... I obviously have my own like fingering systems and I, I don't know, they're kind of whack. So like when I actually write in what I do, I'm always like, Oh gosh, <laughs> like, is this going to work for any, like, is this helpful for anyone? Um, wow. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of going through the process of like figuring out like what I do and like why I'm doing it and like whether I actually would recommend other people do it, you know, mm -hmm. or like if there's a better option. Um, and I'm realizing like how kind of endless that process could be. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really excited. Um, I played the fifth suite for a recital I did um, last summer, so I know it pretty well. Um, but obviously, playing any suite and especially recording any suite for any sort of <laughs> right. thing that will be on the internet for a long time is kind of a gar gar gargantuan project. So, yeah, currently I'm kind of like that's kind of on hold, and I'm going to finish it like probably in the beginning of the summer, like when we have a bit of a break from the symphony schedule. And I, I think I'm recording an ISB recital, but that's going to be like its own concoction of random pieces. Um, yeah. TBD. Okay. Yeah. No, I hear. I'm. I'm. I am supposed to be recording something for ISB with uh, George Amarim from South Texas. Uh, so we're gonna figure it out. Where the hope was to do it, and and this may still happen. Just fly me to Texas, and we'll just do it in person. Um, because it's got all sorts of meter. Like it'll be quite the project to do remotely. Um, uh, but we'll see. If I, that might be the way it has to has to go. That's awesome that you're doing that with String Virtuoso. I I I've been digging into that. They, I've been talking to folks involved with that and and i've been digging into the site and watching what are, are you are you just going to play the piece or are you going to talk about anything are you is there any you're doing that also there will be tutorials and i'll also be doing some like orchestral excerpt tutorial oh, videos cool. like I, I think i'm supposed to do like hello mm -hmm. and some things like that um but yeah it's so weird i had like six weeks off from the symphony because they were doing all this stuff with winds and brass and like we had a spring break and like a couple other um breaks in there but and I thought I was going to like get all of this done, but I don't know. It's weird. Maybe I just needed a break. I think yeah. everyone's kind of gone through periods of burnout. So yeah, I think not, nothing, yeah. nothing wrong with taking a break. That that's for sure. Wow. Okay. That's, that's really cool that you're doing that though. That's, um, uh, d did I ever tell you about my course that got seized by the FBI that I filmed? 
D- did I ever tell you? Oh my God, what? <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you the short story because people have, have heard this on the podcast before. But so I, you know, I, I filmed a couple courses with Discover Double Bass, which is really fun to do. So I, that was like hilariously close to the beginning of the pandemic. I think it was over in Leeds in February. And and um, I didn't have to play anything like the Bach Fifth Suite. It would have been a much more stressful <laughs> trip. But um, but uh, I had, I, I that wasn't my first bass course though. I actually did a bass course in 2018. I was writing the bass course course while I was subbing with the Oregon Symphony. I would like go to my Airbnb after rehearsal and work on this. And I went to Salt Lake City. I was working with this company, Musicians Toolkit, filmed this course, uh, and it never came out because one day in December of 2018, I get this call from the company saying that the FBI had raided their headquarters and seized all of their property. And I thought, well, that's odd for a music education company. And it turns out they were owned by somebody, a, 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 an individual named Galen Rust. And I believe he's in prison now because he was running a Ponzi scheme. Oh, he owned 11 companies and one of them was a silver trading company. And they'd been running a Ponzi scheme. I think it was over $200 million. They defrauded investors. So, um, so my course along with all the other assets and then they had courses, they'd filmed with some former like beach boys and stuff. It was, it was, it was music education related, but it was also like pop music too. And it's just in some, I'm expecting it to come out on some foreign language website one day. The, the only th- thing I have left from that course is this very wacky clip of me doing a children's show about the bass. They filmed this and there's this woman that goes, what's that sound? And I appear literally in a ball of fire and, and she says, it's Jason with the bass. And I play, so I've got, I got a lot of fun memories of uh, filming stuff like that, but it's tough if you're, if you're doing it, um, it's tougher if you're doing it on your own because you got to figure out the, or maybe you'll do it with Zach, but, but like can in fact, you probably will, because isn't Zach into into filming and that kind of thing? I, I, am I remembering right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, for all the electric bass yeah. people listening, he has a YouTube channel all about effects pedals. Yeah. I think he has like 7,000 subscribers or something crazy like that. Yeah, he used to work with companies all the time. They would send him pedals and he would review them. Um, so yeah, it's a huge interest and passion of his, um, and he did a lot with it. But now he's a software engineer, so he's kind of gotten in a different route for now. But yeah, different. There, there. I'm sure that there are lots of joys and also frustrations of doing something like that and going all in. You know, it's probably a little more predictable with uh, software development. But that's cool. Congratulations! I, I don't Definitely. know if I actually told you. Congratulations! And I, I knew you were. I knew the marriage was coming up, but that's uh, or the wedding was coming up. But that's great. That's really. That's that's really. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, it was so funny when I was at ISB, like me and Sam, we got an Airbnb together, and I was just like in a tizzy the whole week because I was like, it was a week before the Baltimore audition and three weeks before the wedding, and I was just like juggling all weeks. I think like my phone like broke that week and like wouldn't turn on for a while or something too, and like Sam was just so patient. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. Well, Nina, I can't believe it. I, I put out like like 550 podcasts since we last talked. We've got we got to do it more often than this. I I, uh, um, I, 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 I have no rhyme or reason for doing these things. Things just like pop. You know, it's it's there. There's 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 no plan whatsoever behind this thing. So, but it's good. We got to do we got to do it in person one of these days. I, I feel like we, we you know we've spent a decent chunk of time in person at this point, but we've only only talked over over Zoom or Skype. But well. For the podcast, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully you'll make it out of Baltimore, and then we could hang then and, and do it again. Nina, you rock. Let's do a round three, round four, round five in the future. I can't wait, folks. Links to everything are in the show notes, but ninadecaesar.com will take to take you to everything. And again, follow her on social media, folks. If you spend any time on Instagram, definitely watch her videos. She is awesome. So thank you, Nina, for chatting again. Thank you for listening. I have so much fun doing these episodes. I have been doing these outros unedited for, for better or worse for the last 14 months since I've been trapped at home during the pandemic. But hey, I'm not trapped at home so much anymore. Oh my goodness. California is opening up. I got out of the city of San Francisco uh, last weekend. I went to Seattle uh, for a few days. I'm headed to Texas next week. I record these in batches of four. As you know, if you make it this far, probably a a repeat listener to the podcast. So that's just the way I do things. I try to get ahead, stay ahead, as I learned from Dr. Phil and Oprah (laughs) on some podcast years ago. And so that's how we do things here. It's a Thursday. I'm getting ready. I'm packing for Texas. 
and it's crazy to pull up my suitcase and it's like a time capsule from March 2020. I've got my travel toothbrush from March 2020, packed it, realized I really needed to wash it <laughs> once I got to Seattle. So it's great to be getting back in the saddle, being vaccinated and all of those good things. And yeah, feeling positive here. I'm about to take the dog, whose name I will not utter to not get him too excited, over to North Beach. Well, we live in North Beach, but over to the cafes and hang out for a bit, meet my wife for some dinner, and we're coasting into the weekend here, all sorts of good things. We've got, I always feel like we've got new stuff to talk about here in these outros, and we do, but I think I'm just going to shut up here because I've got three more of these to do, and thank the folks that help make this podcast happen. Thank you to Michael Cooper, Steve Henshey, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes great bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, east about couple hours of Dallas or so near the Louisiana border. Award-winning bases. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I am your ever more positive as we get out of this pandemic host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 